evening, dear viewers. We are gathered here again for our next and most incredible and fascinating interview uh, that would be presented to you from fresh from the American Academy of uh, Dissident Sciences. We are here at a secret location in Pasadena with some of the most astonishing uh, speakers and authors and uh, well researchers in this field. Um, but uh, let us uh, first present the topic of our uh, interview tonight. We will try to talk about uh, the highest echelons of the secret societies on this planet, the highest echelons of Freemasonry, of the Knights Templars, of the Illuminati, uh, uh, secret societies that are probably secret for this very simple reason, that there are a lot of secret things going on at their highest echelons that should not get into the public under any circumstances. And uh, from our humble knowledge into the field, we'll try to create a picture uh, to elucidate this puzzle, to, <laughs> to put the jigsaw puzzle together. Um, with us here tonight, we have the incredible pleasure to have uh, Eustace uh, Mullins, uh, who has been writing in the field of conspiratology and has been exposing the um, secrets of uh, the American uh, evil archy, as uh, some researchers call it, for more than how many years already? 50 years? 50 years, yes. For more than 50 years, and he has published about 15 books 15 years, yes. uh, and five videos that uh, would also be the videos will, uh, will will be available. They are already available from the American Academy, and probably some of his books because I'm sure that there will be an incredible interest in these topics. Uh, with us tonight is also Jordan Maxwell, who has been investigating um, for how many years already? About Thirty-five, thirty-six now. Uh, uh, the secret symbology, the secret symbolic graphic language of uh, these uh, secret societies, uh, the messages that are transmitted through these symbols and how they influence uh, the public subconscious and uh, basically the education and most of all the education of our children. So at the end of today's discussion we would go to the uh, education of uh, the young generation and to the new and upcoming and probably the most interesting book by Eustace which is uh, Education for Slavery. Education for Slavery. Education for the New World Order. Uh, education for this new and upcoming global socialism or <laughs> communism. Uh, a lot more hideous and a lot more sinister than anything that the regimes of Lenin or Hitler or Stalin or anywhere in Eastern Europe after World War II, even possibly in North Korea, any of these evil totalitarian regimes were able to attain. So uh, let's start the discussion with uh, just uh, a, a brief uh, picture, a brief analysis of the uh, top echelons of these secret societies and uh, practices that they uh, are involved in. Uh, it has been widely rumored that uh, the top echelons have been uh, engaging for centuries uh, in homosexual practices, that they have been using these homosexual practices for mind control, not just for horizontal recreation or for kinky horizontal recreation, but for the specific purposes of mind control and of uh, influencing their members. What would uh, you say for that well, topic? You well, there's no question that there is a demonic element in homosexuality, which, by the way, the psychiatric profession has never dared to touch. And of course, you cannot treat a homosexual uh, uh, by a psychiatrist without going into the demonic uh, practice that it uh, really is. So this remains a great gap in the treatment and in the literature on homosexuality because, you see, this goes all the way back uh, to the dawn of history, to Genesis, to the Canaanites, the curse of Canaan. And the Canaanites have always used homosexuality, uh, not only for control, also for, for uh, to break down the uh, integrated personality, 
which gives you a much more pliable subject. And uh, uh, it's a basic feature of behaviorism. Uh, it's very interesting. I mean, we would not like this uh, tape to sound as uh, another gay bashing tape. We have nothing against probably 95% of all gays that are basically practicing recreational homosexuality. Uh, what we're interested in here is uh, the very small percentage of uh, gay men that happen also to belong to the social subset of uh, secret societies and especially the highest, the most high echelons of these secret societies that engage in homosexuality for uh, totally different purposes, namely for mind control, for social control and so on. Uh, what would you say, Jordan? Well, if you remember that secret societies as, uh, as uh, social movements, as uh, Eustace says, go all the way back to the beginning of man's history. And there has been um, uh, two schools of thought concerning the modern day Freemasonic societies. One is that they started out as a good idea and eventually got corrupted uh, or that they never were any good to start with and that any society that needs to operate in secret uh, just was not any good to begin with. In the middle of the night. Yeah, and so I tend to believe that uh, any time you have societies operating in secret um, there's, there's always going to be this element of uh, activity that's covering something. Um, and it's fascinating, as we were saying before, when you get into the symbols and emblems of these ancient secret societies, going all the way back to the Sumerians, and as uh, he brought out the uh, ancient Canaanites, um, throughout the Middle East, symbols and emblems are like alphabets. It's like symbols in the alphabet. If you put enough of them together, they will tell you a story. And that's the kind of thing that I've been interested in in years, is the way these emblems and symbols in government, religious orders, fraternal orders, uh, all have connecting emblems and connecting concepts, and it's a fascinating subject. It's a very secret alphabet uh, that allows only the initiates of the highest echelons of the secret society to understand the messages. It's like a, a subspace channel coded message uh, of well, if you understand hyper that, words. Well, that if you understand that doctors have their own language, attorneys have their own mm -hmm. language, uh, the clergy have their own terminology in their language, uh, it's only to be, uh, it's only to be, even teenagers and young people have their own language. And so it's only to be expected that secret societies would have their emblems and symbols and ways of connecting themselves to each other in foreign lands and terminology. But I'm saying that if you go into the uh, national coats of arms of nations, flags, uh, all of the halotry of the, uh, coming out of the Middle Ages, all of these things have a very powerful significance on the world in which we're living today. And uh, there's a whole world of knowledge operating beneath civilization. Uh, I have certain, I've heard some rumors, I mean, basically we cannot in two hours here bring indestructible evidence. A lot of uh, uh, the discussion tonight would be about uh, rumors and stories and so on, but still they paint a picture that is quite a bit self-standing. Standing. I've heard, for example, stories that the highest echelons of the Knights Templars are a uh, Sodomic society. Uh, what would you say on that matter? Well, I think that's true. I think that's borne out. And in fact, uh, when the King of France, I think it was Philip, um, when after the Templars, homosexuality was one of the uh, reasons for the crackdown on them. But of course, what he really wanted was the fortune, the great treasure, which the Templars had amassed. And also, he felt that they were a political threat. And so, uh, he would uh, gain several objectives at one time, and also gain their treasure by attacking them on the, by then, I think, well-established grounds of homosexual practices. So basically, there is no way for somebody to go that high in the hierarchy of these organizations 
without being homosexual, at least in the Knights Templars. I think not. I think it's, part, it's almost like a very advanced initiation ceremony. And, of course, engaging in homosexual pra practices becomes a final committal to the uh, innermost purposes of the order. And once you've done that, and I guess there's no coming back, really, once you've been initiated into homosexual operations or activities, there's really, you can no longer be a non-homosexual. There's no coming back from that. And I think that uh, they realized this and that they wanted this as a the final commitment from the uh, official. How about Freemasonry? Uh, do you, have you heard any stories about uh, the highest echelons of Freemasonry engaging? Well, in? Uh, if you go back into the most ancient times, religion has always had sex connected to it, and especially the occult religions are very, very uh, uh, connected in so many ways to sex. Sex was a very big part of the ancient world and of the uh, symbols coming out of the ancient world uh, and it even comes into our modern day in so many ways that we don't even think about such as the Washington Monument Washington DC is the male phallic and it connects with the oval office which is the female which is the generating force which is the G for Freemasonry, the G within the square and the compass stands for the generated, uh, the generative force of sex. And as I said, the ancient world had uh, a very heavy influence uh, on sex. Sex was used in all of the rituals, and especially words and terms, and black symbols. magic sex. Absolutely, and uh, and I believe that the people who are at the top of the world today are using, are using sexual magic and I think that's probably why so much sex is uh, flaunted in movies, television. The sexual revolution yes. itself? Yeah. Free it's sex? All part of not a revolution just for freedom and mm -hmm. free sex, mm -hmm. but it has an integral part to play in the overall occult movements of the world to open the human mind up to sexual perversion also lowers the inhibition in a human being to accept anything. And once you have, um, <clears throat> once you have compromised your morals in that way, you are now ready to be compromised with money. The next step. The, the next step and with power and, and then you've been bought. So because I've heard that basically the highest levels of Freemasonry are quite a bit into homosexuality. That and should not surprise me. It becomes uh, basically a very cozy boy, boys club and in a way an initiation into the next and higher degree is probably all the members of that secret Masonic cell taking <laughs> turns at the... Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I have once a newcomer. Teacher, I have once a teacher make the point that I thought was very significant just in passing, that this whole um, apparatus that we call the secret societies uh, has as its basis a war between the sexes going all the way back into the prehistoric world and that for so many thousands of years the woman was the uh, the symbol for spirituality, the goddess, mm -hmm. and then with the coming of the Roman Empire more emphasis was placed on the gods as male and so today we have this male domination of the world and yet there is this very important connection between male and female well, that's why you have temple prostitutes in the, uh, in the ancient world because there's a lot of very important connections can be made between the act of sex and the psychological connection with God some sort of a spiritual connection with God during the time of sex and so that's I think uh, very important to keep in mind that probably these people at the top of the secret societies are without a doubt sexual perverts. Uh, Eustace, what would you say about uh, another and very interesting secret society, namely the um, Skull and Bones, because this is a secret society not of elderly men that have reached the 33rd or the 38th degree of Freemasonry, but these are young kids uh, in the 21 year old or third year of, of, of college that are initiated in that society. Uh, have you heard of any uh, homosexual well, overtones? 
Oh yes, the uh, initiation ceremony of Skull and Bones, which finally began to leak out after many years of total secrecy, uh, the fact is that the uh, initiate into Skull and Bones, first of all he has to strip off all his clothing, then he has to lie down in a coffin, and there he recites every sexual experience that he has had throughout his entire life, whether with male or female or what they did. And so uh, this is in the presence of his brothers, you see, the fraternity brothers. So in other words, he is t totally confessing all of his sexual activity of the, uh, his life to that time. And they are now in possession of this knowledge so that they have not merely a weapon of blackmail, but a black, uh, weapon of control because whenever he sees one of his fraternity brothers around the campus, he knows that that brother knows all of his innermost secrets of his life. And uh, in other words, you place yourself totally in their hands. And uh, the Skull and Bones, of course, was set up by the Russell Trust in 1858 as a branch of the German Illuminati. And apparently this is also an Illuminati technique, probably developed by the Jesuits to uh, force the initiate to place his, his personal history and all his secrets in the hands of his fellow uh, uh, members and uh, then he after and then he uh, after this recitation of his personal secrets he then stands up and is supposed is born again as a new person under the guise of the Illuminati skull and bones and uh, the members of this fraternity, by the way, there are other fraternities on Yale University, but it was generally known by the uh, students there that Skull and Bones was the, the peak. In fact, uh, uh, a Yale student told me one day, he said, it was known on the campus that if you were tapped for bones, you were set for life. You would never have to worry about career or fortune uh, because you would be taken care of. And only 15 seniors each year are tapped, you see. Yeah. And they are from the most elite families, the Harrimans, the Rockefellers, and uh, uh, the Bushes. He was a, his family was an employee of the Harriman interests, and so that's how Bush was chosen. Families of, that have been for many generations into Satanism and black magic and secret societies. Yeah. Also, there is a funny fact that when you are induced into the skull and bones, you basically lie naked in a coffin. Yes. Uh, not only that you recite your past uh, sexual exploits, but you lie naked in a coffin with a red ribbon tied al around your uh, lightning rod. Oh, yes. uh, also, I heard that uh, they do something like a rush where everybody is naked and they kind of jump over and fall over and then pile upon this new inductee and what goes on <laughs> in the middle of this <laughs> frenzied rush I cannot say but it, it looks like kind of a preparation for future <laughs> sodomic experiences uh, plus another funny uh, initiation right that they have you have to go and dig up a grave of a famous person and, and, and steal his skull that's how the skull of Geronimo oh, was oh, yeah. stolen by one of the famous boners and, and, and then brought to their uh, uh, shrine which is a whole building in, in the middle of Fiel University campus uh, the skull of another famous uh, American uh, several Mexican revolutionary leaders were dug up and so on which is a, I mean, like a gory uh, story from a horror movie I mean digging up a grave and, and taking out grisly bones you know to be initiated in a, a satanic society if I use the uh, language the nomenclature uh, of the communist totalitarian governments basically this is like uh, a satanic Komsomol society a youth Youth Satanic League, basically a prepar preparation society, preparatory society, uh, uh, so that these members would rise much higher into the uh, highest echelons of uh, Freemasonry and, and the Illuminati. After I think that, it's important right there to make the point that the skull and bones was a Freemasonic emblem. It is a Freemasonic emblem. It was always on the graves in Europe of high uh, degree Freemasons uh, on their graves would be the skull and crossbones. They kept, uh, even the, the uh, pirates of the Caribbean, uh, even the pirates would uh, run the Jolly Roger, mm. the black flag with the skull and bone. Not only Freemasonic emblem, but I was reading a book on black magic and there 
there was a uh, photograph of a table set for satanic rituals, so the daggers to kill the victim, uh, and there was a skull and two femur bones in the very same exact geometrical position and shape as the emblems of the skull and bones. Right. And you know that in the language of symbology there is basically nothing coincidental, and uh, that for me was a very strong indication that there may be some satanic overtones into that uh, <laughs> campus fraternity society. On top of that, all these strange voices that were coming uh, through the locked doors of this uh, temple until somebody broke in in the 70s and in one of the rooms they discovered full regalia of Nazi flags, uniforms, uh, swastikas, posters. Basically, uh, uh, it's obvious that uh, on top of being uh, with strong homosexual overtones and, and, and uh, preparatory for satanic practices, it also practices uh, Nazi elitist uh, philosophy of the white elite. Now this particular uh, uh, area I'm not that familiar with, but I know that, that the introduction of perverted sex opens up one's, it lowers one's inhibitions to start with, and then opens one up to further corruption, as we said before, that then uh, one is not uh, averse to maybe uh, monetary uh, corruption, and from there to lying to political corruption, and once so you're into that lifestyle. It's a short road. Yeah, it's a very short road, and you know there's no coming back, because as Eustace brought out, uh, all of your cohorts with you know what you have done, and that's the uh, that's the way that they can keep control over you. Uh, Jordan, you mentioned something interesting about the G letter, the G horse, the uh, emblem on the Masonic uh, yeah, so shield. Masonry, the square in the compass has the G in the middle, and, and the G stands for well, the. Many people thought the G stood for God, and then there were some who felt that the G stuff for geometry which uh, which had some basis for belief but uh, actually if you go back it goes all the way back to the generative force of sex generating the generative force in, in the, nature in the generative organ which that's is right. the male organ which is the male uh, which is the male organ absolutely so that's why only men are admitted in Freemasonry yeah, well, it has quite a bit to do with the superiority uh, of sexual superiority uh, of the male over the female and uh, as I said that this goes back to the Roman Empire these and symbols and emblems were used and that's why the Mason carried these little aprons because as this big curtain separates the holy altar in the uh, tabernacle or the shrine from the place where the audience gathers mm -hmm. in the same way here this little apron uh, this little curtain in front no, that's separates exactly the right. holy altar the male generative That's symbol exactly right. from uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. the unini unish uninitiated uh, population. No, that's exactly right. That, that is precisely what the symbolism is. It's, it's the uh, it's the holy curtain that divides uh, the male generative force from the uh, un uh, from the uninformed, from the mundane. And um, sex has a very so, so so basically the highest god, the highest altar that Freemasonry bows to is the male generative yeah, organ. That's right. That's and true. that's why uh, that emblem is uh, put in stone in that obelisk in uh, yeah, Washington. Washington Funnily enough, in the middle of the park of the heroes fallen in the <laughs> Bulgarian Revolution in the fight against the capitalist and the fascist mm -hmm. in the middle of that park on a hill overlooking Hall Sophia in Bulgaria uh, that's my country way back in Europe in Eastern Europe uh, there is a obelisk that is a carbon copy of the Washington Monument mm -hmm. a carbon copy and behind that obelisk there is this square long lake exactly a carbon copy of that lake which is the symbol of the female vagina mm -hmm. Uh, so, so basically, these monuments were copied uh, through Eastern European Freemasonry, which was the conspiracy behind communism in all of these Eastern Euro oh, uh, European countries all over Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, I would like to go now into basically the relationship of, of, of sex, and especially uh, homosexual sex, 
with, uh, with uh, mind control, but Jordan wants to add something. Yeah, I want to add something in relation to the point that you were talking about Eastern Europe and, and, and communism. Are you aware of the fact that the, uh, that the communist symbol of the, uh, of the sickle, the hammer and the sickle, were in fact separate symbols for thousands of years? The sickle was used in one way and the hammer in another. And only into the communist uh, party did they put the configuration together, the two occult symbols. And what was and, their meaning? Well, the sickle represented Saturn. Saturn was the god of chaos, uh, Kronos. And that's why uh, even at the end of uh, end New Year's, you have old man time, the old man, and then the baby crawling, which is the new year. And old man time is always hanging on to a sickle. Mm -hmm. Because old man time that we say goodbye to at the end of the year was the planet Saturn. Mm -hmm. Saturn was Kronos, or chaos. The old god of chaos who was leaving the old order and the coming new order, which would be the new year. And how about the hammer? The hammer was the symbol of the order. Well, and the hammer was, goes all the way back to the old hammer of Thor, which was the old Aryan hammer of Thor which was used to reconstruct. You tear it down with the hammer and then you build no, up. You tear it down with the sickle and you build up with the well, hammer. Yeah. So what I see here is a pictorial-graphical uh, expression of this same old satanic uh, slogan of Ordo of Kao. That's exactly right. You order out of Kao. You, you hammer the thing. order with a hammer that was created out of the house, ha uh, chaos uh, That's it. Uh, of the sickle. That's right. Fascinating. Is used to Ordo of Kao. Mm -hmm. And the hammer is to build a new order so that Ordo of Kao. New order world of order chaos. out of the chaos of... Uh, and let me make this point that Saturn was called Chaos. That was the name of a god. And that god is traced back to the planet Saturn. Fascinating. So that Fascinating. old man time at the end of the year is actually the planet Saturn or Chaos. So let's go now into the connection between uh, homosexual sodomic practices and mind control. What would you say, Eustace, about, uh, well, let's say, the certain research that was done by Wolfram Reich in Germany and several others that uh, you were mentioning on... on well, of course, uh, Reich wrote The Function of the Orgasm, and uh, I think that his understanding of the function of the orgasm was that it, it brought you into a relationship, not merely a sexual relationship, but a uh, relationship of submission to control, a final submission that you would never rebel against anything, because once you made this, actually given your uh, body and your integrity, the integrity of your body, you know, uh, the sexual act is generally called, if it's not in the marital uh, realm, is generally called a violation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You violate a child, you violate another person. And so uh, by submitting to this violation, you, uh, you sort of sacrifice yourself to the purposes of the order. It is a sacrificial uh, gesture. That's very interesting. Uh, we were talking with uh, Al Bilic about the mind control experiments that were going in the underground Montauk base and he gave a fascinating rendition of the work of Wilhelm Reich, its connection uh, in uh, the American underground bases, work on mind control, with the previous work on mind control that done by the SS in Germany, with a still previous work basically of, of uh, sodomic mind control that is practiced by the black magic uh, priestly uh, cults of, of Tibet, the, would it be the red caps that engage in black, uh, in black magic, uh, as a contradistinction to white magic, but basically what the story is that when the student and the teacher engage in such a homosexual act, uh, when the student is brought into a neo-orgasmic state, then certain pathways open between the subconscious of the student and the mind of the teacher, and then the mind and the teacher who is already deep into black magic, and abuse of that personal uh, freedom and personal uh, right to choose your own destiny. Uh, the teacher enters into the subconscious and can do all these DOS commands of, of erase, delete, change uh, uh, on the mind, uh, on the subconscious of the student. Uh, this is done in Tibet to impart certain higher t 
types of knowledge directly from the teacher into the student. In exchange, in return, the teacher consumes of these higher classes of energies that are released at the time of the orgasm of the student. And basically in these black right uh, priesthoods, uh, fornication goes on all day long. If there are girls around, fine. If there are no girls, boys. If there are no boys, all the an animals in the courtyard. I mean, this is a uh, common practice there that uh, yeah. makes no impression <coughs> on anyone. Right. Uh, these practices were used by the Germans uh, especially by Wilhelm Reich. I mean, the story is that in his laboratory, fornication was going on around the clock. <laughs> and even here in the United States, he had uh, special, uh, I mean, his uh, security guards were basically trained to shoot first and ask questions later. Uh, and especially any mess messengers from the FDA. Uh, but they were they were doing these in experiments around the clock. Uh, what Wilhelm Reich discovered was among uh, the many things that he discovered, one of them was the orgone energy, and basically the orgone energy. This is the orgasmic energy, as yeah, I understand yeah, right. it. And through manipulation of that orgone energy, they later work on weather warfare, basically weather engineering for warfare purposes, creation of um, um, hurricanes, creation of storms of tornadoes of incredible power with a, with a machine as, as a small and portable as an armchair or probably in its biggest size as uh, big and mount just a machine mountable on a truck. Um, the, these photographs are very well known from the rare books by Wilhelm Reich that were expurged from the public libraries in the best Orwellian tradition. Uh, so back to the mind control. Uh, it was very convenient for the Germans because in the SS they would indoctrinate the highest echelons of SS uh, using these practices. And later on in the 50s and 60s, especially in the underground Montauk base where Al Bilic was working as an engineer, they would abduct boys, uh, teenage boys from uh, the streets of Long Island, uh, put them in these underground dungeons and in uh, I mean, most of these stories have been uh, related to in our previous films. In the film by Preston Nichols, A Visit to the Montauk Base, uh, they even found the cages where these boys were kept before sodomizing and mind controlling them in not just changing some of their files, but basically completely erasing their <laughs> jaws directly and substituting it with a new one, with a totally new personnel. And then these boys were supposedly sent forward in time, uh, possibly to be the new perfect agents for the New World Order, let's say in the upcoming riots in Los Angeles. These were experiments done in the 50s and 60s. What a better way uh, to create a perfect anonymous agent without any background for, 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 for these of us that have seen the French film La Femme Nikita about the creation of such a perfect government agent uh, from a lady that was uh, sentenced to death and the public was notified that the sentence has been carried out but actually she was not killed and hidden in a special underground indoctrination and training center where she was turned into a total assassin. Uh, the Montauk project was an even more uh, more precise and uh, diabolical operation because there are dozens of boys were turned into totally mind controlled individuals and sent forward in time. And these practices were done through mind control. Much, much later on they developed electronic chairs where you would be brought electronically to, to this near orgasmic state and then they would do the same mind control operations on you. Uh, so let's come back to the basic education of kids. Uh, I wouldn't be amazed that this high uh, early introduction to homosexuality is meant not only to compromise the morals of the person, but also to prepare him for future mind control manipulation. Just as you were mentioning today that basically in the English boarding schools, the, these were very accepted practices. Well, that's true. And in fact, you always had the elites, uh, the children of the elites were always subjected to these practices because uh, there again, it made them more amenable to carrying out the program. In other words, they would not be rebels. They would be people who would fit in. They would be trained to fit in. So the education, you see, is not merely uh, imparting knowledge 
You know, education is many things. It is training, and as you point out, it's also seduction. And in fact, I'm corruption. Corrupt seduction. I'm afraid education today is mostly seduction and corruption, and the imparting knowledge is a very minor part of it. And brainwashing, basically, the fascinating film by the rock group The Hood, The Wall, another brick in the wall, creating new bricks for the total wall, bricks by the millions, faceless bricks that are not different from any other one in this giant wall. Uh, yeah, basically, I mean, these uh, English boarding schools where most of the teachers were single and it was accepted, basically. And our American elite was trained in New England boarding schools, which essentially carried out the same practices as the English schools. Or or in, in, in all boys military academies, where these well, practices the were carried academies. even more so. Definitely. Uh, it's fascinating that such homosexual practices have been widely uh, practiced in Japanese culture, too. And uh, even in the Japanese culture, they have a very well-developed homosexual poetry and homosexual art. Uh, I mean, it is not paraded very much in public these days, but if you are a connoisseur of, 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 of specialized Japanese art, you would be fascinated at the abundance or overabundance of, of homosexual poetry and and paintings, uh, which means that uh, even there the elite has been basically quietly led into the ways, into the fold, by their secret societies, which, <laughs> as usual, would have the emblem of the dragon, and we all know that the dragon is the symbol of the empire of independent angels. I want to call them fallen angels uh, on this planet. So... Uh, what is the bottom line here of, of all these discussions? That basically mind control is practiced with, with uh, all possible means. I mean, in, in, in 20th century, a lot of technical means have, have, have supplanted homosexuality. We have uh, mind control frequencies beamed at us through the television sets, mind control frequencies uh, piggybacked on the cellular system phone network, microwave frequencies beamed from special transmitters or orbiting satellites that directly resonate with cranial cavities and create uh, the effect of hearing sounds or even uh, obeying orders, basically totally controlling the individual. Microchip implantation uh, for the purposes of monitoring and mind control. Uh, basically, of, uh, I think that um, Martin Cannon is one of the best researchers in the field of uh, microchip implantation by the government uh, with his book, uh, The Controllers, which is also available uh, to the public. Uh, through Freedom of Information Act release documents, uh, the CIA has had secret programs in microchip implantation into unwilling, basically unwitting subjects. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, we're talking about 40 years of uh, microchip implantation techniques. Uh, microchips for mind control were available well before microchips were officially uh, discovered for personal computers and, and bigger computers. Uh, so my feeling is that this is basically an, an, an evil archy, uh, <laughs> as we were laughing with Eustace today, uh, Demonocracy. It is a demonocracy, there's no question about it, and it, it is composed of elitists. In fact, I saw the term uh, used in political magazines a few years ago at uh, when some revelations were coming out of Washington about J. J. Edgar Hoover, who was not only a, a leading Mason, but also was a well-known homosexual. And uh, the term home in turn was in quite current use for some time. That, in other words, the world was... Uh, Instead of the common turn or the communist, the, the world is being <laughs> governed by the home in turn of the homosexual, the, of the homosexual <laughs> elitist, which really was not far off the mark. And uh, uh, that was only used for a short time and dropped out of sight, was never used again. <laughs> but I thought that was, the home in turn. <laughs> well, uh, I, I thought the home in turn was quite a, a, a very telling uh, thing, and I guess it revealed too much because it was not in currency very long. Suddenly it was dropped, never mentioned again. I, I haven't heard that term in at least 10 years. I think a very important uh, uh, writings was done about 
20 years ago called The Religion of Revolution, in which the uh, article was written by, I believe, Rush Dooney and, uh, out of Texas. And it was an exceptionally uh, penetrating article about how homosexuality has been used and sex in general but especially homosexuality has been used to prepare the human race to accept other things. And it was very well documented. It was a very interesting study. And it was called The Religion of Revolution. And, uh, and it, used, it showed how sex was being used to prepare people to accept, as it said, uh, the, the rape of the people and the rape on their minds, the rape on their freedom, and that sex was a very integral part of all of this. Uh, sex was used to prepare the people, I and mean, what a better exa uh, example to that than the heavy metal concerts uh, that are used to prepare the young generation for mm -hmm. the further acceptance of all these practices. Basically, why would one never find uh, a violin or an arp as a musical instrument as part of a heavy metal uh, band because I mean these are instruments that uh, basically resonate with the uh, frequencies of the higher chakras of the highest and, and oh, yes. basically the several top chakras so they would uh, be um, detrimental counterproductive to a society that would like to stimulate the lower chakras of these lowest basic instincts. On the contrary, the drums and the heavy metal uh, guitar, especially the bass guitar, resonate in the uh, frequencies of the lowest chakra, the groin chakra, of the sexual drive. So when uh, thousands of kids get uh, titillated to an ecstasy on a heavy metal rock concert, this is nothing more than an uh, audio frequential acoustic uh, massive uh, masturbation yeah. uh, amplified by thousands of uh, um, watts of, of, of acoustic power blasting from the speakers. I mean, there are very nice pieces in even into heavy metal music, but uh, in the I enjoy some of them, but what's important here is that uh, as an overall package, the bottom line is that the heavy metal music does not enhance and elevate the vibrations of the highest chakras that would allow you to telepathically communicate with highest uh, orders of uh, intelligences in the universe. On the contrary, they, they basically titillate your most uh, primitive basic sexual drives and instincts. And there's another book that I think you should know about. It's called Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television by Jerry Mander. Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television. And in there, he was a... Uh, the owner of the largest um, advertising agency in America, in San Francisco. And he basically, in the book, outlines how television has used, uh, how it's put together, the mechanics of how television it was designed, and how it's put together, and gets into the, uh, the electronics of it, and then talks about how uh, sex, he brings that point in about how sex is promoted through the television, and how the electromagnetic force field that is around you when the TV is on. Uh, it's a very interesting book, uh, and it has a lot to do with what we're talking about here. You might want to try and find it, and it's still available in bookstores today. Uh, I've been thinking for the last month or, s month or so, occasionally watching television here, uh, <laughs> this funny story with Michael Jackson, uh, and with my typically conspiratorial, suspicious mind, what else can a mind be of somebody having the professional or cultural deformation of uh, Eastern European totalitarian communist country. But anyway, I was thinking, well, what the hell would the family be that would give its child uh, to spend a night or a few nights or even on a regular basis, regardless of what the amount of money is that they get paid for doing that? Uh, and I was thinking, could it be that there is some bigger story behind this uh, superficial story we are getting in the media? Could it be that uh, these uh, could be families uh, that all belong to the same satanic society 
and that they are giving their kids to be initiated, to be brought in the fold, so to speak, at an early age, because uh, the younger you start, the earlier you start uh, on your career with the, basically the Young Communist League, I mean the corruption of the mind in Eastern Europe, the primary school Communist League, then the secondary school Communist League, the pioneers, the high school Communist League, which is the Komsomol. The, uh, the younger you start in this field, the earlier you can get into the Communist Party, which is the springboard. Every one of this is a springboard for the next. And once you are in the Communist Party, you are assured uh, a pretty good position. So in a similar vein, uh, parents of such ambitious parents, ambitious and corrupt parents so that have been in the fold themselves for a long time, uh, they probably bring out their kids uh, to be initiated. What's your feeling about that? Oh, well, I'm quite sure that this is a factor, and I think this may be going on a lot more in the movie and television industry than we realize that the family is now used. Uh, I think the case of the Menendez, Menendez brothers uh, also bring in some of this because he was an important figure in the entertainment industry and uh, so why were these two sons apparently being inculcated into these practices it could very well have been a vocational uh, program that uh, uh, he was inducting them in uh, absolutely so and uh, uh, I mean the whole pattern I mean the whole personality of the father of the Menendez boys uh, an extremely ambitious, overly ambitious individual that started from nothing and rose quickly uh, into that industry. I wouldn't be amazed that the fastest way, the fastest and strongest springboard to rise into the secret societies in the world would be probably uh, to be a member of a satanic cult, which is the innermost core, the innermost circle of, of, of a secret society. Uh, what's your feeling on that? Yes, as a matter of fact, you know, they have something in Hollywood. Uh, well, let me go back and say this, that the old Celtic or Celtic magicians in England, uh, the old Druid priest, the magicians, uh, always worked their magic with magic wands. And magic wands were always made out of Hollywood. And oh. today, uh, we still have uh, Hollywood being used to work their magic on us and uh, I think it's interesting that when you get into the symbolism in Hollywood there's something called death head colors in Hollywood and that is every time there is to be a rape or, or a violation of a human being and especially a death there will be certain colors which will always come up and certain symbols uh, are worked into the picture so that subconsciously the subconscious mind picks up these colors and symbols every time there's to be a rape or a death and uh, around Hollywood it's called the death head colors and death head scenes and so uh, they're still working their magic on us in Hollywood today uh, a lot of uh, well, well, what's your feeling Eustace on the Satanism in Hollywood basically black magic and Satanism well I think that Satanism definitely is a factor in Hollywood because first of all uh, you've got mass media mass communications here which means you reach the entire population so if there's any place that Satanism would want to have an outlet it would be here absolutely about that. Yes. I mean, so many of the films that, I mean, forget about the horror movies, which are uh, not only clear, pure uh, satanic rituals, many of them, but I've even heard stories that uh, the film crew and cast uh, would do a black uh, mass every morning before uh, the beginning of the shooting of such a film. You know, uh, Merv Griffin a few years ago uh, uh, had on William Blatterley, who was the uh, author of The Exorcist, and he was also the director of the movie The Exorcist. And it was interesting that when Merv Griffin asked him, where did you discover all, where did you get all of this material on Satanism and devil worship and 
and all that kind of scary stuff in the movie. And he said, well, I worked for the mind control department of the CIA for many years. Right. And he says, and the CIA is definitely uh, up, on, uh, up to speed on all of this because they use this throughout the world. And uh, another important, well, I, I don't suppose I should bring that up, but it was on Merv Griffin's show, so I will. Uh, Merv Griffin asked me, he said, well, there was someone else that worked in the mind control department of... Uh, of uh, the CIA at the same time w you were there. He says, would you like to comment on him? And he said, yes. L. Ron Hubbard uh, was uh, also indoctrinated in this kind of thinking, too. And so I Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. I've heard stories that uh, the Monroe, what was his first name? The, the Monroe. Monroe. The Monroe guy of, of Monroe Institute was yeah. also yeah. was also a member of the same department with the CIA. Uh, it's a very interesting line by uh, uh, Stan Deo in his book, uh, The Cosmic, Cosmic Conspiracy, Conspiracy yeah. about the infiltration of the intelligence organizations on both sides of the ocean, uh, on both sides of the curtain, so to speak, uh, by secret societies that basically the empire of uh, independent angels uh, works in the very same pattern. If you know the workings of inside the KGB, these secret societies within the secret society within the secret society, you would know what hap what is going on here in the United States. Uh, uh, there is a fascinating film, actually two films that we produce early. One of them came from actually from Germany, UFO Secrets of the Third Reich where they give the whole backbone structure of, of secret societies that gave the rise of the Third Reich. Half a dozen people were more influential into bringing the Third Reich upon the heads of the German population and all these casualties that were uh, its result and, and on all of Europe and the world than, than, than anybody else in Germany. The Knights Templar branch uh, for Germany, the Tempelhof Gesellschaft, organized the Thule Society in 1919. Later on they organized the Vril Secret Research Society that started with anti-gravity research in the uh, late 20s. Uh, they organized the SS part, uh, the, the National Socialist Party, uh, to carry on their policies in the broader German population uh, for the creation of a new world order, the new order, the Neues Ordnung that Hitler was talking about and for the preparation of the coming of the new age. In 1919, the Thule Society was founded for that very same purpose, to prepare the German society for the coming of the new age. I mean, this is uh, 70, uh, 60 years before the new age became a catchword in, 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 in California. Uh, but this whole uh, secret society, within a secret society, within a secret society, uh, I mean this whole system was carried on in Germany, uh, within the National Socialist Party was founded the SS as an even more secretive organization than the, uh, than the party itself. Within the SS later on they founded the super secret society, the Black Sun. And I think the members of the highest echelons of the SS were also members of the Black Sun. So, in their special castle, I forgot the German city. Uh, yes, I got the name of the castle. Babel, uh, Babelsberg. Oh, they had a very special SS castle that was built uh, over a, a, a greatly renovated and enlarged medieval castle. Right. But they had an underground round chamber with 12 seats, the usual 12th number which was their secret chamber for probably satanic and uh, sodomic practices. And according to Stan Deo, to come back to his book, uh, Cosmic Conspiracy, I mean, this is the pattern of the Luciferian presence on the planet to control the secret societies at the very elite. Uh, uh, I mean, to the, the intelligence organizations through these secret societies. Uh, also, these stories <laughs> that I heard recently about uh, the, uh, an interesting sect within the KGB, the so-called castrati, uh, a, a secret society where the ritual castrations of the initiation of the black and bones through the, into the black and, uh, I'm sorry, into the skull and bones society here, which is a red ribbon time around the uh, fowls, uh, there is carried to the end and these people are actually castrated, which gives the typical facial expression 
as of uh, a lot of the KGB uh, high members of the 30s and 40s. So we have the same practices over and over and over.